And now we're going to move on and talk about seeds. So Gwen Wian is the Southwest Seed Partnership Coordinator for the Institute of Applied Ecology. The Southwest office is in Santa Fe, and that's where she works. Um, Gwen is uh, working toward the goal of increasing the availability of locally sourced native seeds for ecological restoration, both in New Mexico and Arizona. And she's working with partners to identify what seeds should be collected, and she oversees the agricultural seed production. She earned her bachelor's degree in ecological restoration from Cal Poly Humboldt, and her master's in biology from the University of Northern Colorado. And her thesis was focused on the implication of local adaptation for restoration seed sourcing. Prior to IEE, she managed a multi-state research project at Colorado State University that sought to better understand forest regeneration after drought-induced pine, pinyon pine die-off. <coughs> she was conducted research on many native taxa and has contributed to germplasm conservation efforts through her work as the National Lab for Genetic Resource Preservation in Fort Collins, Colorado. When she's not working, she can be found holding up a whole group on a hike to look at a bee or an eat lichen. You can relate to that, right? <laughs> and she's most happy surrounded by fresh vegetables at the farmer's market and loves to grow flowers and support native pollinators in her garden. Please welcome Gwen Wian. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, my name is Gwen Lyon, and I am the Southwest Sea Partnership Coordinator at the Institute for Applied Ecology. Um, I've been studying native seas for um, many years now, and I'm just completely fascinated by this tiny biological unit with everything that it needs to become its own plant um, and its own individual with its own genetics. Um, I'm just completely taken by this. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I found a really great fit um, at the Institute for Applied Ecology. So um, the Southwest Seed Partnership is a collaborative group, and we are made of lots of partners. Uh, there are just a few of them listed up here. We work with folks in the federal government, as well as state and local government, um, non-governmental organizations, growers and nurseries, um, researchers at universities, local tribes, really anybody who wants to be involved in native plant material production, um, we want to work with you. Um, can everybody hear me all right? No, oh, okay, thank you. Um, so all of these partners have come together with a shared goal, which is to increase the availability of native plant materials for restoration and conservation in New Mexico and Arizona. We see this goal as achievable through this two-state multi-partner collaboration that leverages resources um, to supply diverse species as well as diverse sources to all types of restoration projects. And all of this um, should be underpinned by a diverse and sustainable native seed economy, which we also work to build. Um, the Institute for Applied Ecology leads and coordinates this partnership. So at IAE, we're able to talk with all of our different partners about their needs, what species they need, what sources they need, um, and we're able to pool their resources and leverage them to um, get as close to our goals as possible. So a little more on the Institute for Applied Ecology. We are a nonprofit organization and were originally um, started in Corvallis, Oregon in 1995. And our Southwest director, Melanie Giesler, was a longtime employee in Corvallis. Um, and in 2015, she was tired of the rain and the gloom in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> And she decided to relocate back to New Mexico, where she grew up, and she wanted to continue doing the same kind of work here that she did in Corvallis. So she um, learned all these great skills and did all this great work there and wanted to bring it here. So she started our Southwest office in 2015, and that is the same year that she um, 
founded the Southwest Seed Partnership. The mission statement of the Institute for Applied Ecology is to conserve native species and habitats through restoration, research, and education. So IAE is indeed much broader than just the Southwest Seed Partnership. Um, we complete restoration projects, have uh, research related to restoration of native plants, and have several educational programs as well. I also have up here the mission statement of the Native Plant Society of New Mexico, which is to educate the public about native plants by promoting knowledge of plants, fostering plant conservation and native habitats, supporting research, and encouraging the appropriate use of native plants. And I have both of these up here next to each other to highlight some of the similarities um, in the goals of both of our organizations. Um, we want to conserve native species through um, education and teaching people about native plants, as well as support research and encourage the use of appropriate native plants in uh, restoration projects to conserve um, ecosystems. And because we have these um, goals that are in line with one another, the Native Plant Society of New Mexico has been a supporter of the Southwest Branch of the Institute for Applied Ecology since the very beginning in 2015. Um, we received funding from the Native Plant Society of New Mexico to um, create a native plant curriculum for New Mexico. Um, this is it right here. It's called From Ponderosa to Prickly Pine, Exploring the Native Plants of New Mexico. And this is an eco-regional curriculum that is made for high school age kids. Um, to teach them more about native plants that are local to them. Um, and it also serves as a um, curriculum for native plant workshops that we put on, as well as our Forest Bound program. Our Forest Bound program is a, uh, a summer educational program for high school age kids. It's completely free. Um, kids can apply online and um, once they um, are in the program, it is a one-week course in uh, local national forests, so they get to go out for day trips and learn about native plants, learn how to collect seeds, um, learn about the environment around them, as well as some outdoor skills. Um, so another area um, where the Native Plant Society of New Mexico has provided support <coughs> is in our checker spot butterfly recovery efforts. This is the checker spot butterfly right here. Um, it's a tiny little butterfly, and um, it's found only in a small portion of the Lincoln National Forest. Uh, very recently, it was listed as endangered, and in 2020, we found two butterflies in the wild, and uh, 20 in 2021, so it is in danger of extinction. Um, primarily that is because uh, wild horses will graze on the key plant species that it needs um, to survive. Both uh, the New Mexico penstemon in here, this is this butterfly's um, larval host plant, and also um, nectar species that it relies on. So um, the Institute for Applied Ecology has been collecting seeds from these um, New Mexico penstemon and nectar species for um, years now. And in 2021, the Native Plant Society funded the grow out of um, all of these seeds at the Native Plant Nursery at the Pueblo of Santa Ana. And uh, we relied on volunteers to help us transplant these seedlings to restoration sites within the Lincoln National Forest. Of course, they were gated off, so uh, wild horses could not graze them. And um, we have had about 97% survival in the first year, which is awesome. And the last area of support that I want to highlight from the Native Plant Society is in capacity building for native seed production. Um, the Native Plant Society provided funds to um, build capacity on three New Mexico uh, native seed farms, and also um, to kind of revamp a greenhouse at um, Sandia High School, and a greenhouse at the New Mexico State Penitentiary, and um, both of these facilities are currently in use. We have an educational program um, where 
students at Sandia High School and um, adults in custody at the New Mexico State Penitentiary can learn about um, native plants and propagation and um, gain skills in these areas. Um, and this year, uh, both of these nurseries are growing out uh, horsetail milkweed for upcoming um, monarch habitat enhancement projects that we uh, have planned. Um, so with that, thank you for your support over the years. Um, here I have an outline of the remainder of my talk. First, I want to spend some time talking about the need for seed in the Southwest, um, both to understand the need that we have, and also I'm going to spend some time talking about the native seed industry as it is today. Um, then we will all take a journey through um, our plant material development process at the Southwest Seed Partnership. And then I'll spend a few minutes talking about what's next for the partnership, our plans for the future, um, and for growth. And then at the end, there will be a quiz. Um, there's, not, I, there's not a quiz, but I do have some questions for you um, to consider. So with that, I'll get started. Um, so there's a uh, shortage of native seeds in the Southwest. Many areas in the Southwest are experiencing increasingly large, severe, and prolonged disturbances. Um, just this last year, New Mexico experienced um, devastating wildfires. And these events will have lasting negative impacts on our watersheds, um, erosion, um, spread of invasive species, flooding, all of these things um, will result. And natural disasters like this, along with um, human-caused disturbances like construction and uh, natural resource extraction, um, all of these things have and will continue to, um, to change our landscapes in the Southwest. Um, and we know that healthy and intact ecosystems provide services for us. Things like nutrient cycling, uh, purifying water, and also supporting all of the plants, insects, and wildlife that we value. Um, and oftentimes after an ecosystem experiences a disturbance, it has this amazing ability to regenerate. Um, plants, native plants can come back through seeds that are stored in the soil or that come in from surrounding intact areas. Um, but in cases where we have these really large, uh, large in scale and severe disturbances, this uh, capacity can be lost or take a really long time. And these are the cases where we need ecological restoration. Ecological restoration is the process of assisting in the recovery of an ecosystem after it's been damaged, degraded, or destroyed. And in response to this widespread need for ecological restoration, the Department of the Interior, in partnership with um, other federal agencies and many non-federal partners, published this document, um, the National Seed Strategy. And this document recognized that in order to meet this widespread need for restoration, we need appropriate native plant materials. Um, in order to get from a disturbed landscape, put this one up here, uh, to one that is healthy, intact, functional, um, is, is a long process. And our ability to repair these damaged lands and stem the loss of economic and cultural benefits to society depends on appropriate plants, as well as research, um, decision-making tools, and also public support for ecological restoration. And we really needed this um, coordinated national effort to get to uh, where we need to be. Um, and it takes years to develop plant materials, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. But it can sometimes take five to ten years from the time you're out making a wild collection of a native plant to a time where you're able to use that uh, material in um, restoration. And we don't know where the next wildfire will be, how large it will be, or how many pounds of seed we'll need to restore those areas. 
And so we have to be ready. We have to start preparing. Um, and our goals and our planning at the Southwest Seed Partnership are very much in line with this national seed strategy. Um, we see our goals as um, being aligned with this national seed strategy, but applied to our Southwest region. And the overarching goal of uh, Southwest Seed Partnership, as well as this national seed strategy, is to have the right seed available at the right place at the right time, where we, when we need to restore an ecosystem. Um, so that might beg the question, what is the right seed? And when I'm talking about the right seed, I'm talking about native species that are locally sourced and presumably have um, some local adaptation and that are diverse. We need both a diversity of species for restoration as well as a diversity of sources and genetic diversity. Um, I think it's helpful to consider the native seed market in the Southwest as it is now. Um, and there are four major players in this, four major seed producers in the Southwest, um, and they are up here on this map, it, the blue <coughs> stars. Um, and you'll notice that they're limited in number. Um, these are large companies that have hundreds of acres of production, and they are very good at what they do, um, but they're limited. And you might also notice that only one of them is located in New Mexico. If you were to look through their catalogs, you would see that they have this major focus in producing grass species and very limited selection of forbs available. Um, and primarily, they are offering cultivars, which we'll talk more about. Um, but cultivars have limited genetic diversity, and they're not always appropriate for our arid southwest climate. So um, this is the industry as it is now. I want to spend a little bit more time talking about cultivars, which are also known as traditional varieties. Um, so I'm going to go through the development process, um, a typical development process for cultivars. It's not the only one, um, but it's a common one. And I'm going to be using Lovington Blue Grandma as an example. Blue Grandma is a very common native species, and uh, Lovington Blue Grandma is one that originates in New Mexico and is actually a really great cultivar for our area. So, um, a tradition... <laughs> A uh, cultivar or a traditional variety will start with a wild seed collection um, from a native population of plants. In the case of Lovington Blue Grandma, the original seed was collected in 1944 near Lovington, New Mexico on a loamy upland range site at an elevation of 3,900 feet. Annual precipitation for this area is about 14 inches. So now we have our source seed, and um, we can, it will go through um, some artificial selection. We can plant it and look at all of the individual plants, look at the traits that they have, and select the traits that we find most desirable. So um, it's a little blurry, um, but this is just a blue grandma plant, and I have them as different sizes to signify that there is some diversity there, that they don't all look the same. Um, and so we have this diversity from this original collection, and we're selecting for things that we like. Um, common things that we're selecting for are more forage, um, maybe more seed, pounds per acre, um, so in the case of Lovington Blue Grandma, we have 15% uh, more forage than other strains of Blue Grandma. So maybe we're selecting these larger plants. Um, and of course, it's highly palatable for livestock, and it produces 200 pure live seed pounds per acre. Um, so you can imagine if you are a seed producer, you might want um, plants that are uh, predictably giving you lots of seeds to harvest and sell. Um, you might want plants that are larger in size if you are grazing cattle. Um, these are all really attractive traits. Another thing we'll select for is uniform phenology. Uh, phenology is the timing of um, different, uh, the timing of reproduction in plants. So uh, uniform phenology means that all of the plants will set, will go to flower at the same time, 
and then all the seeds will develop at the same time. And you can imagine that's really useful in a production setting because all of the seeds mature at the same time and you can just take your combine and go through and collect them all in one foul swoop. So it really uh, streamlines production. So um, we've gone through artificial selection and we've created our uh, cultivar. And from there, um, it can then go to production. It can be given to uh, large scale producers that can plant acres and acres of it and harvest the seed to sell. So um, this type of production, the, the genetic diversity of that original collection has um, been decreased so that all the plants have very similar traits. They have similar phenology. Um, in the case of Lovington Blue Grandma, the plants are uniform in growth. And um, when in production, the stems average 32 inches in height with a leaf height reaching from 20 to 22 inches. We can then harvest the seed and sell it, and it can be used in restoration. Um, I'm going to compare this to our development process at the Southwest Seed Partnership. It starts with collection, and the first difference here is that um, we start with multiple wild seed collections, um, usually between 10 and 20 collections from a target source area. And we completely skip the selection uh, process here. We are using these wild collected seeds and planting them into production fields. So our fields contain a lot of genetic diversity. Um, the plants might be different sizes. They might, the phenology might be different among them. Um, and then we collect the seeds that are produced there and we can apply it in restoration. So, um, if you imagine that any individual organism or plant has a certain set of environmental and ecological conditions that it can exist in, that it can continue living in, um, if you are using a cultivar and that cultivar doesn't do well in the environmental or ecological conditions of the site, um, you run the risk of losing all of the individuals because they are so similar to one another. Um, but with our seeds, the idea is that this is a bet hedging strategy. Both our seeds are locally adapted because they come from local populations, but they're also diverse. So the idea is that even if the conditions are not ideal, hopefully there are still a couple, uh, some individuals that are able to withstand them that are well adapted for the site that you're planting it at, and those can survive. And that just increases the um, chances that your seeding project is going to succeed. Um, so just a little review. Um, traditional varieties will originate from one or a few seed collections and undergo selective breeding for things like uniform phenology, large size, high seed yield, um, and, you, and they also have known performance and streamlined production. Um, our seeds come from many source populations. There's no selective breeding, and therefore the production seed has high diversity. They can be more challenging in production, and so there is a hesitancy to adopt this type of plant material. Um, and they have diverse phenology, so um, that can be more challenging in a production setting, but you can imagine it also might be beneficial in a restoration setting. If all the plants are flowering at different times, you have a larger window of flowering for pollinators. Um, if seeds are maturing at different times, you have a larger window where um, seeds are available for granivores. Um, and um, they have increased adaptability. So um, that concludes the needs to proceed in the Southwest. And now we're all going to take a journey through the plant material development process with the Southwest Seed Partnership. These are our Southwest Seed Avenues. Um, all of the routes that a seed collection that we make can uh, go. And we're going to go through each one of them. It all starts with collection. Um, these little tiny brown dots are all of our collection locations. We've made more than 2,000 collections since 2016 across New Mexico and Arizona. Collection is completed by our seed collection crews. 
Um, we hire early, so these are all of our crews from last year. Uh, we hire early career conservation um, technicians to um, work on RC collection crews. And um, we really appreciate the work that RC collection crews do. They're temporary employees. Um, often it's the first job they have out of college or some of them are still in college. Um, and they do so much hard work throughout the season and just bring so much joy to our office. Um, and really the work that they do underpins everything else we're able to do. So um, we deeply appreciate our, our seed collection crews. Um, so, so this year we have plans for five crews. Um, so our seed collection crews will start around April or May and um, we get them trained up. They learn how to identify native plants, make herbarium collections. Um, we take herbarium collections for every plant population that we collect from. Um, they learn how to collect data. And once they have all the skills, they go out and scout for plant populations to collect from. When they're going out to scout, they're looking for um, species from our target list. We don't collect rare species. We um, don't collect specialist species. What we're looking for are really generalist species that occur over a wide range. Um, sometimes they're called workhorse species because um, they are commonly used in restoration and are reliable. Maybe they do well in kind of disturbed sites. Those are the types of species that we're targeting. Um, so we're looking for large, healthy populations, more than 50 individuals. And then our seed collection crews will track the phenology of them. Um, we'll revisit a population multiple times throughout the season so we know when it's flowering, when the seeds are starting to develop. Um, and that way we are ready as soon as the seeds are at their peak of development, we're ready to make the collection. When we make the collection, uh, we want to recognize that seeds are a renewable natural, uh, renewable natural resource. And so we want to do it in a sustainable way. We never take more than 20% of the seeds that are available. Um, we leave 80%, at least 80% of the seeds um, to, to uh, regenerate the population. Um, and once we've made our collection, um, the seeds go to our seed studio, which is located in Santa Fe on 2nd Street. And there we have these specialized um, equipment that we use to clean the seeds. And uh, what they do is separate the seeds from the flower parts, the leaves, all of the other stuff that gets uh, collected. Um, we have specialized protocols for each of the species that we work with. And um, once we've cleaned the seeds, they get packaged and labeled. Um, oh. Um, we have seed cleaning volunteer opportunities. Um, <laughs> I forgot to put that in there. Um, yeah, we have seed cleaning volunteer opportunities every couple of weeks. Um, so if you're interested, um, it's kind of a nice opportunity to come sit around a table and uh, just clean seeds and get to know other people who have the same interests you do. Um, and we have some other volunteer events too. Um, we do seed collections. Um, we have uh, weed pooling volunteer events at Leonora Curtin Wetlands that are led by Yvonne Hickerson and Barbara Fix of the Native Plant Society Santa Fe chapter. Um, and then we also will have camping and restoration outplanting volunteer events, um, as well as herbarium voucher mounting. So um, I have a QR code if you, if you are interested in uh, being notified of our volunteer events. Uh, you can sign up and get an email um, whenever we're recruiting volunteers, or you can follow us on Instagram, um, where we always advertise there as well. Um, usually I have paper signups, um, and I forgot those today, but if you uh, want my business card, you can send me an email and I can add you to our volunteer list. Um, if you just want to stay updated on what we're up to. <laughs> um, so, after that sidebar, <laughs> um, back to cleaning. <laughs> um, so, 
Now our, our seeds are cleaned, they're processed, um, they're packaged, and uh, we need to store them. And this is a really important step of the process. It's not a very exciting one, um, but seeds are living things. And in order to maintain their viability, we have to keep them in cool and dry conditions. And so we have a 10 by 10 foot walk-in seed cooler with a dehumidifier, and we're very proud of our seed cooler. Um, we keep it at four degrees Celsius and 25% uh, relative humidity. Those are ideal conditions for keeping seeds alive for as long as possible uh, for short-term use. Um, another form of seed storage, uh, part, a portion of each of our collections will go to long-term storage for conservation. And um, the purpose of this is to keep seeds stored um, in perpetuity uh, so that we can have this genetic uh, material forever. And, um, and so uh, a portion of each of our collections goes to a special government seed lab where they have um, this big vault. And um, this is the inside of the vault here. And there are all of these seed collections. Um, and it's kind of like a library of genetic diversity. So we have it safe, it's stored in case we ever need to draw from it in the future. Um, from there, um, now that we've made some seed collections, we can start thinking about um, seed production. And as I mentioned before, we um, will combine multiple wild seed collections to build the source seed for a production field. And we use the best available guidance for combining these collections. Um, Ideally, we would use empirical seed transfer zones, which are based on uh, common garden studies, where you plant all of uh, the plants in one area and uh, look at their traits um, and use that information to create seed zones that are spe species specific. Or we would use genetically informed um, seed zones. But unfortunately, um, those aren't available for the vast majority of the species that we work with. There's a ton of work being done in this area right now, um, but we're just not there yet. And so we tend to use more general seed transfer zones, um, either provisional seed transfer zones or ecoregions, which is um, what's on this map here. These are the different ecoregions throughout New Mexico and Arizona. And um, these ecoregions group areas based on um, similarities in ecology and climate. And uh, basically, they just say that anything collected, um, like let's say these four stars are four collections um, within the southwestern tablelands ecoregion, anything collected in that area um, is safe to combine. Um, and we might further, um, we might, we, we might kind of fine tune this a little bit more and um, consider what elevations each of these collections were made at and um, choose to combine collections that were collected at similar elevations or look at soil types. Um, those are kind of some of the things we consider. Um, if you look at these orange stars, these are all, these are all collections from the Arizona New Ma Mexico Mountains ecoregion. Um, and you can see that this one over here has some physical separation from here. There's a desert in between them. And so we might not feel comfortable combining using this seed source here, but these, because they are um, not physically separated by a desert, we might feel more comfortable combining those. So those are some of the things we consider when we are building accessions to form the seed uh, for a production field. Um, Seed production. So we sometimes we use wild collected seed in restoration, um, but it's not a very cost effective way of doing things. And it's possible to deplete the wild populations that you're collecting from if you're doing it over and over again. Um, so really, the best way to increase the quantity of locally sourced seed um, is through production, agricultural production. And this is just like production of any crop that you might be more familiar with. 
uh, where the species are grown, um, a single species in a field, in rows, and under irrigation. And um, our production fields are grant funded. So a specific partner will say, I want a quarter acre of this species. They will fund the field. Um, IAE will do all the coordination. And then all of the seed from that field goes back to that partner. So we contract with local farmers to grow native grasses and forbs um, like this. And um, our contracts are, I mentioned before that um, growing seeds, our seeds, um, our locally sourced and diverse seeds are more challenging because they don't have uniform phenology. You don't know how much seed they're going to produce. There's a lot of unknowns. And so uh, we do contracts where farmers are paid for maintaining the fields, not by the yield of um, seeds that they produce. And this takes some of the risk off of the farmer. Um, they still need to maintain the field, keep it uh, relatively weed free and water the plants and care for them. Um, but they are not paid by the pound of seed they produce. So all of the seed is harvest that's harvested is delivered back to the partner, no matter how much it is, um, the the farmer does receive payment. And um, the farmer has the option to retain some of the seed that they produce to expand their acreage and grow seed on speculation. Um, so not part of our contract, um, but grow, to sell them on the open market, which is kind of our dream. So um, the producers receive um, starting seed or plugs we like to start with plugs usually because they have a really high uh, rate of establishment. Um, and we contract with local nurseries to produce these plugs. Um, we provide technical assistance throughout uh, for the plot preparation um, and planting. And throughout the life of the contract, the farmer can always call us up and ask us questions if something weird is happening. Um, we provide technical assistance for harvesting seed. And we also uh, usually will provide um, this, like labor for planting and harvesting um, to the best of our ability. Um, and then we clean the seed, test it, and store it. The producers um, prepare the plot, maintain the field, uh, harvest the crop, and deliver the seed back to us. Um, and they provide an annual report for research and development purposes. Um, we are working with a lot of species that are, you know, maybe not on the market or haven't been um, previously produced commercially. And um, so we want to know what works and what doesn't work. Um, we're, we're really interested in that kind of information. And so native seed farming can provide benefits to farmers as well. Um, it's a way of diversifying income and um, our contract production model really eliminates a lot of the risk there, allowing farmers to try new things um, without taking on that risk. Native plants are really hardy, and they can do well in even marginal farmland where maybe uh, traditional crops wouldn't do so well. They can um, actually improve soil health, especially if you're working with perennial species. They have great root systems. Um, and, and they are better suited to combat climate change. There are fewer inputs. They require less water, less fertilizer. Um, and they store carbon underground in their uh, root systems. And especially if you're planting um, a flowering species, that can even um, help improve pollination in other crops because they uh, will attract pollinators that can then um, visit the other crops on the farm. Um, so it's a great way of diversifying your farm and um, trying something new. And it's just kind of an emerging and niche market. Um, these plant materials are in high demand and um, land managers are willing to pay more for, um, for this really high quality and diverse crop. Currently, we are working with six growers producing 19 species on six and a half acres. Um, and this year we are expanding to include eight growers, um, 21 species on almost 13 acres. 
These are just some pretty pictures of uh, some of the species that we're producing. Um, and for each of these species, uh, we have multiple sources um, and multiple ecotypes in production. And here are some of the forbs or flowering plants. Um, back to our uh, seed avenues. Um, all of the work that we're doing is not worth much if the seed isn't applied in a way that um, is successful. Um, so we have um, a seed request on our website where researchers at um, accredited institutions can request seeds to do research on. Um, they do genetic testing and uh, research in production and in restoration trials, all of these things. So uh, we do our best to supply seed to researchers whenever we can. Um, and we also um, engage in our own research, um, kind of as a reminder, uh, varieties are well known and well tested, uh, but our seeds are don't have a lot of testing and um, we don't know very much about them. Um, so one project that we started last year um, includes these three species. We have uh, one acre of production for each of them. And this map will show you all of the collection sites that went into um, creating the source seed for these species. Um, so we have established production for each of them and we're uh, doing genetic testing on the source seed as well as the seed that's produced. Um, to better understand how um, how the genetics change throughout this process, because that's not something we really understand. Um, we're also doing trait measurements to better understand how traits um, change throughout this agricultural process and this development. And uh, we're using the production seed in restoration trials in several sites throughout New Mexico, and we're going to be monitoring seedling emergence establishment and uh, the traits of each plant. Um, yeah, so we have our production seed, it needs to be cleaned and stored, and then finally, um, we get to restoration, and I want to highlight one project that we're working on, um, which is enhancing habitat for the New Mexico jumping mouse in the Santa Fe National Forest. This is the New Mexico jumping mouse. Um, it's kind of a peculiar little creature, it actually spends about nine months out of the year underground hibernating. Um, it's active for three months out of the year, and in that time, it um, eats and it breeds and it births, and then it goes back to hibernating. <laughs> <laughs> this is the type of habitat that the jumping mouse lives in, these montane meadows. And um, we've seen declines in the jumping mouse. It's an endangered species. Um, due to uh, lack of water in these kinds of ecosystems, um, as well as grazing that reduce the plants that it depends on uh, for food. And um, so last year, one of our seed collection crews made um, seed collections of the plants that are really important in this um, mouse's diet. And this year, we are growing out all of those plants at the um, Santa Ana Native Plant Nursery. And uh, we will be relying on volunteers to plant, help us plant them um, at our restoration site later this year. And we don't have a date fixed, but early to mid-August, it'll be a two to three day camp out and a little bit of a hike to get there. Um, but our goal is to uh, get 6,000 plants in the ground. So um, if you're interested in joining us for this, let me know, um, and I can make sure you know when it's happening. And I actually went to visit um, all of the plants in the nursery last week, and um, they're doing great. Um, so that concludes our, uh, our journey. Um, and the last kind of part of this, um, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about what's next for the Southwest Sea Partnership. This is our strategic plan. Um, it spans five years, and it was developed by uh, the Institute for Applied Ecology and the Southwest Sea Partnership Steering Committee. We have four major goals, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on each of them. 
The first is to assess the needs and gaps in the supply and demand chain for native seeds in our region. Um, so we want to know what species of seeds restoration practitioners need, um, what sources they need, um, where they're planning restoration projects. We want to better understand this industry. And so one way we are trying to better understand this is through our Southwest Region Native Seed User Survey. This survey is meant for a broad range of native seed users, everyone from land managers, restoration practitioners, um, landowners that seed their own land, um, researchers, anybody who buys or uses native seeds is welcome to take the survey. So if you'd like to take it, let me know. Um, and these are some preliminary results, um, but folks say they need seeds to be uh, to apply to the Chihuahuan ecoregion, the Arizona New Mexico mountains ecoregion, and uh, Arizona New Mexico plateau. Um, those are kind of some major areas where people are doing a lot of work. When we asked what species and attributes people needed, um, people want early seral species that can um, establish and do well in really disturbed sites. Um, often they're annuals, um, and they can help with erosion control. And folks also want forbs uh, to support pollinators. Um, like I mentioned before, there are a wide variety of native grasses available um, and much, much smaller selection of forbs. Our next goal is to expand capacity for native plant material development across New Mexico and Arizona. And we want to um, expand our work in every step of the uh, process. So we want to continue to make seed collections, collect more species, and um, collect species from new locations, um, more sources. We want to engage more people in this type of work and build public support for plant material development. Um, and one really crucial area we need to expand capacity in is in um, native seed farmers. Um, there are very few uh, major players in this region, and so we want to engage more people to uh, start producing native seeds on their farms. Um, so I have the four major uh, farmers that I mentioned before up here, and we work with two of them. We have fields established at Bammer and Southwest Seeds, and um, we also work with six small um, local or smaller producers um, throughout New Mexico and Arizona. And uh, we want to expand. Um, our third goal is to support farmers and nurseries growing diverse, locally sourced materials while bolstering the Southwest native seed industry. Um, we want to know what producers need, um, what the obstacles are to native plant production, what hesitations they have, um, and we want to support them in the transition to growing these materials, especially growing um, more diverse and um, locally adapted materials as opposed to cultivars. So some of the ways we do that are through our contract production model. Uh, we provide source seed or plugs for plants. Um, we also have worked with um, local farmers uh, to apply for grants to have funding to expand the capacity on their farm. Um, things like plug production or uh, drip line tubing, those are kind of the things that we're applying for funds for uh, with local farmers. And um, one thing we're really interested in doing we have in the near future is organizing equipment shares because this is... Um, one thing that um, is really crucial for small farmers, um, it's a lot of labor if you don't have equipment to help you um, to help you harvest seed or plant. Um, and so a lot of local farms say that equipment shares would be really helpful um, to reducing the amount of labor and making this more profitable to them. And our last goal is to deliver research-based restoration techniques and tools. Um, like I said before, uh, we can have all the appropriate native plant materials, but if they're not applied in a way that has good success rates, um, then, you know, they're not worth much. Um, so, so back to our state of seed user survey, we asked folks what they need um, to help them with their restoration projects or seeding projects. And um, 
people want eco-regional seed menus, which is basically like a listing of plants that might be appropriate to plant in a specific place. So it's kind of a broad listing and um, then the land manager can um, pick and choose what they want to include in their seed mix. Um, they want guidance for seeding rate and planting density and an online listing of commercially available eco-regional native plant materials. Um, it's kind of a pain to go to all the different seed websites, look at their catalogs, and then you contact them and they don't actually have them in stock. Um, so this would be a really helpful tool for uh, people buying and using seed. Um, so we want to better understand what people need um, so we can help meet those needs. And with that, um, uh, that concludes my talk. Um, since 2016, I just have some um, stats here. We've made over 2,000 wild seed collections, um, and we've used 700 of them for production, research, or directly into restoration. Uh, we've started 29 production fields and produced over 3,000 pounds of native seeds. Um, with that, um, thank you all so much um, for coming today. Um, I also want to um, thank the Institute for Applied Ecology, Melanie Kiesler, who is our director, um, Maria Mullins, our assistant director, Ashley Tyler and Yvonne, who are our uh, ecologists, Taylor Kane, our plant material technician, does all of our seed cleaning and lots of other stuff. Um, and Maria, who is our Education and Outreach Coordinator, um, the Southwest Seed Partnership Steering Committee, as well as um, Zoe Davidson and Sam Rees at the uh, New Mexico BLM, and Catherine Kennedy at uh, the Forest Service. Um, and with that, I just have a few questions for you to consider. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll open it up for questions for me, or if you have a comment or an answer to one of these, all are welcome.